welcome to the Friedman Adventure Studios at beautiful 22nd Street Landing. Am I excited to tell you we've got a great Wahoo seminar planned for you right now. Those enigmatic, great-eating, speedy, toothy fish that everybody wants to catch. And we have none other than Sam De La Torre from Island Fishing Tackle in Carson, California, here to talk about the glorious Wahoo. First of all, Wahoo are a member of the mackerel family. They live in tropical and subtropical seas all across the world. The largest who? 183 pounds, but they're rumored to grow as big as 200 pounds. That is one big fish. They're mostly solitary and sometimes found in small schools, but you never seem to get into a 100 or 200 fish bite on Wahoo. You kind of move around and keep doing that. They're one of the fastest pelagic fish in the sea. They can attain 60 miles an hour. In a 10-month period, Wahoo have been known to grow about 20 pounds. They live to six years in age, so if they get to 200 pounds, you can see how quickly they grow. They can change colors, and of course, we've all heard the tales of somebody winding a jig in to the boat and lifting the lure out of the water and a wahoo launching itself right through the galley window. That is not a fable. That has indeed happened. So without further ado, let's join Sam De La Torre and learn more about how you can realize your wahoo fishing dream. One of the most interesting fish in the sea, sought after. So many anglers want to catch the regal wahoo. They're so fast and speedy. They're so delicious to eat. You're going to give us some tips on how to take wahoo. Well, I'm going to do my best. You know, the stuff that I've learned here over the years, mostly fishing with the guys on the Royal Star. They've taught me so much over the years. And, and, uh, and so I got a lot to thank you know, those guys about uh, what we're going to talk about today. A few tips, some things that maybe are common sense, maybe some things you've already kind of figured out, but maybe, maybe we can show you a few things that, uh, that uh, we can uh, make your Wahoo fishing a little bit better. And basically what I'm gonna go over is just questions that I get in the shop a lot, you know? So I, like I always say, if there's a 10, 15 guys that ask about it at the shop, there's gotta be another 100 guys out there that, that wanna know the same information. So. Absolutely, absolutely. So this kind of Wahoo tips that you're gonna give, will this apply to wherever you're fishing Wahoo or just on the San Diego long range fleet or? I think most of it's gonna be long range fishing for okay. sure. Um, yeah. You know, I haven't really done other Wahoo fishing, so maybe some of it may apply there too. Yeah. I just, I couldn't say for sure, but definitely if you're going to go on a long range boat, long range style boat, um, and, and try to target Wahoo, this is where that applies the most. All right, let's get into it. All I'm right. excited. So a few things, there's not a whole lot of, you know, this or that to it, but uh, definitely, you know, uh, we're going to start off with trolling. Just, that's going to be the way we find them. Typically, we're trolling along. We might be trolling for a while. and. What we're trolling a lot of times here, it's been the most popular lure has been this Nomad DTX Minnow. It's kind of taken over the uh, Wahoo finding uh, trolling that we've been doing over the last 10 years or so. Uh, what we used to use a lot of, and not that they don't work, they still work, I see them work all the time, is the, the Marauder. Yeah, you know, that was the go-to jig. Yeah. But things have changed. Things have changed, you know, and, and these, I, I've seen it so many times where you got two of these in the water and two Marauders in the water, and these always seem to get bit first. So if you're going to be trolling, you want to definitely pick up one of these here. They've, they've got about 20 different colors. And from what I've seen, it doesn't really seem to matter a whole lot. Um, I've seen everything from the natural bait colors to like a brighter color, something that we're used to, like a orange or a purple or things like that that we're used to with the Marauders. I've seen those work really good too. That thing's got a lot of battle scars. Yeah, so this one here in particular, um, man, you know, typically uh, one of the gripes that people have is that they don't last. Okay, so... These are a Rapala type lure, you know, a, a deep diving lure, and they are made out of a plastic. So, you know, with Wahoo, it's a pretty intense, you know, bite. So you do have times where these things will break, you know. Also too, when it comes over the, 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 the rail, you know, and it hits the deck, also the crew member's gonna have to subdue the fish with the bat, and sometimes they'll hit this thing. So you'll, you will find that these probably break a little bit more than other lures, but man, they sure do get bit a lot more. This one in particular, I think we got something like 14 or 15 fish in a row and just where it was happened to sit in the wahoo's mouth and, and the crew member had to subdue it, it you know he hit the lure and it broke it oh i see that yeah and, and i bet you if i put this in the water it'd probably still get bit i'll bet it would <laughs> but uh 
but yeah this is a good one here i mean and, and obviously you see all the bite marks it caught a lot of fish yeah excellent so as far as trolling tips obviously you know one of the things that it seems obvious but i hear a lot of guys will say you know should i pass on my trolling rotation you know some guys will say well you know you get to trolling you got four or five guys depending on the boat and maybe one guy gets bit now you got to wind that trolling lure in and the other guys that aren't trolling you know they get to cast out and maybe they can hook a fish so you, sometimes you get into that kind of like trying to figure out whether it's worth it to troll or not my opinion is definitely worth it because many times during the day let's say the boat catches 12 or 13 wahoo eight or nine of those might have been on the troll yeah so you definitely wouldn't that. want to pass it up you know what i mean and if somebody wants to pass up their turn i'd probably jump in and say yeah i'll troll for you you know because i, I, I do see it more often than not that on a slower day, most of the fish that are caught are caught on the troll. Sam, uh, something that might help our private boater friends, but also guys that are on the long range boats, and I know the deckhands are gonna tell you, but jig placement, in the white water, back behind the white water, where do you put them? Typically with these, they'll stagger them a little bit. So you'll have some stuff that's real traditional and close. Maybe not as close as we used to do with the Marauders, maybe a little further back. And then you'll have other lures a little further back. And some of that is also too, when the boat has to turn, sometimes you know the boat will meter fish and they'll turn on it like a fishing tuna. And so when it does that sharp turn, if you keep them staggered, you know, it, it'll help with them uh, not getting tangled. So yeah. you, you'll see some stuff back. If I had to put a number to it, I'd say like 50 feet back, something like that. And then the other one's maybe a hundred feet back. You know, okay. it would probably be about a, a good safe safe distance. And do you see any, do the short, shorter jigs get bit more or the longer ones or it's a crap shoot? The one thing that I do see gets bit more is the corners. I will see see that for sure. So if once again, if you're trolling and, and your team's coming up, you know, have your troll rod ready, and when it's your turn to put them out, man, just try to jump in that corner. <laughs> That's that that I have seen many times get a bit better. All right, sounds good. Yeah. So fish the corner. Another thing too is is if you are going to uh, be on a troll team, and let's say you're not lucky enough to get bit, well, even though depending on the boat you're on, and and I don't want to say this is what you have to do. You want to talk to a crew member first if if they're okay with this, but if you if you don't get bit, don't wind in right away. You know, let your jig stick out there. The, the boat's gonna be sliding forward for a couple hundred yards. So leave your jig out there, and also even maybe put it back another 25 or 30 feet. You don't want to do that right away because if you do that right away, um, you have a good chance of tangling a fish that is hooked, especially if they're right next to you. But once that fish is kind of cleared and maybe gone up the side, you can let your jig go back a little bit, your trolling jig go back a little bit, and you're basically fishing the slide just like the guy that cast out with the, with the Wahoo bomb or something. So I'd let it back out. I wouldn't let out a whole lot, maybe another 15 or 20 feet, but I feel like what happens is that they, they look at it as a wounded fish that just kind of is going back there without a whole lot of tension, and you will get bit, but make sure you keep your hand on the spool. Those things will bite, they'll, they'll backlash your reel if you're not careful. But put it back there 15, 20 feet, let it, let it roll back there, and if you don't get bit, obviously you gotta wind in. But uh, but that's one one extra tip on the uh, on the troll. Excellent stuff, yeah. man. The next part that we're going to go through here is fishing bait. Now, <clears throat> typically fishing bait is is just the same like when you're fishing for for tuna. Nothing really a whole lot of different as far as how you hook your bait or present your bait. Get this thing untangled here. Um, but I will say that you probably fish a lot lighter than you would think. You know, a lot of times we're thinking about big game fishing, fishing a long range, we're fishing with a big reel, like a big two-speed reel. And even though that probably would work some of the time, when you're fishing for Wahoo and you're fishing with bait, typically the reason you're gonna do that is they're not eating the jigs anymore. The jigs typically, when they're biting the jigs, they're gonna produce a lot of bites. And also too, you don't get bit off as much. But um, when that's not happening, you, you gotta kinda like figure out another way to get bit. You're gonna fish a bait. And you're gonna fish that with a wire leader. I don't know if you guys can kinda see this here but uh, a pretty short wire leader. Yeah. You know, 12 inches to 18 inches probably would be the longest you would need. And a hook that's not even that big either. Once again, we're, we're kind of more of a finesse type fishing. You're using lighter wire. The wire they make is all the way down from like 20 pound up to like 300 pound. But you're really in that 20 to 40 pound. And a lot of times you get, it's, a, it's a, their odd size is the 27 pound gets bit really good. And we're using lighter line on the rod too maybe 30 pound the heaviest, a lot of times 25 pound is what I like to use, and a smaller reel. The reason for a smaller reel is better bait presentation, just like tuna fishing. So when you go to bait, you really want to think almost like you're tuna fishing in the sense of your bait presentation, pick a good bait, all that kind of stuff, but also smaller wire and smaller hooks. 
Excellent. Yeah. So that's pretty simple there. I've actually caught, I mean, a couple years ago, I think we got like a 50 pounder on this thing. So one thing to remember too with Wahoo, even though they are a big giant fish and we all want to catch them, they don't fight like a tuna does. So a 50 pound tuna is going to put up a much bigger fight than a 50 pound Wahoo. And a 50 pound Wahoo is pretty big, you know, that's that's much bigger than we normally catch. So Sam, that's on the bait. About hooking the bait, is there a preferred method when you're fishing Wahoo? Um, you know, I, I still uh, will butt hook a bait. I just, uh, when it does land in the water, it takes off. The Wahoo are definitely predatory. So if they see something running around, they're more, probably more apt to chase it around. Yeah. Although there's one other thing you might try that I've, I've seen work really good is if there's Wahoo around, especially if you're on a little bit longer stop, is that you might take a bait and cut it in half, like a live bait, and, it, and to cut it in half and throw that in the water along with the, the, the back half of your bait. In fact, sometimes the guys, what they'll do is they'll cut a few of them, throw them in the water, and then you'll throw yours in, and they're all cut. Because the, the reason that works is basically chunking, but the reason that that works is, is how Wahoo feed. If you see their mouths, those things are like scissors. And there are times when you're fishing a regular bait, you know, whole live, and you, you feel yourself get bit. You, it almost feels like you get picked by a tuna. You kind of wait, doesn't come back. You wind it in. Well, you'll have half of a bait, and it looks like it was cut with the fillet knife. They, they cut it that short. Totally, totally. So if you if you do that to start with, sometimes they'll come out, come around, and eat eat your bait. That's excellent. So that's tip. another one there. Yeah. Next, we're going to go into the jig fishing. Jig fishing is by far, you know, one of the reasons we love wahoo fishing so much is they like to eat a jig. Any fish that eats a jig. We, we like to fish. Absolutely, yeah. man. So probably the number one lure that you're going to see out there is going to be a Raider jig or something like it here. Chrome jig, there's a Hopkins jigs, you know, there's even crocodiles. Pretty much anything that's shiny, the, the Wahoo want to eat. One of the things you're going to also see too is going to be a single hook. The reason for the single hook is going to be that if you can see it's got a larger gap, so that's going to grab a little bit more meat. And with Wahoo, keeping a fish hooked is probably one of the hardest parts of it. You might, if, if, you, if you're able to, to land half the fish that you hooked, you're doing really, really good. In fact, it's real normal for a guy to only land one out of, let's say, seven or eight hookups. You wow. Know? It, it's just the nature of that fish. They're moving so fast. They have hard bony mounts and they head shake real hard. So it's, they just come off, you know, and I, I wouldn't get too caught up in trying to solve that problem. It seems like, it seems like it's a problem. It's just. I don't know, there's no answer for it really. I mean, except for maybe having sharp hooks, that's one thing you could do on all your jigs is review them. You know, if you've had that jig for a couple of years and you fished it and caught a couple of fish on it, even throughout the day, if you caught two or three fish on that jig, go back, inspect the hook, make sure that, that, that it's nice and sharp because having good hook penetration is probably one thing you could do to try to keep a fish on. The next one here that is my favorite, I like fishing a Wahoo Bomb. So this one here is the red and black one there. It's probably my favorite color I don't I don't know why I just I've had good luck with it maybe that's why yeah right yeah but you will see that these guys here will have the skirt the hook a flasher back here and it's a goal head and they already come wired so that's one of the kind of the nice things about a wahoo bomb is is uh, most of them, not all of them but some of them already come wired and so right out of the package you just tie it right on your line and you're ready to go on this one here particularly one thing that I want to show you guys it has this this uh, um, stopper right here it's a uh, Carolina keeper basically is what it is and the reason that they have that on there I, I used to not really know why until I, I caught a couple of fish and lost a couple of fish and I figured out why what ends up happening is that when you go to cast this thing and it lands in the water well the jig is heavier than the hook so if your Carolina keeper is up away your jig is gonna fall faster than your hook and your hooks gonna be out here so that the Wahoo might e eat your jig on the drop and miss totally miss the hook so what you're going to find is if you do catch a fish or get a bite, just the speed of those things swimming away with your jig is going to move this Carolina keeper up. So if you get a bite, short, if you get short bit and you come back up, make sure you check your Carolina keeper. And if it's up, slide it all the way back down because that's going to keep your jig right by your hook. So that's one thing that I, that I, I do see a lot of guys don't, don't do. And, you know, and you're so excited, you get bit, you just want to cast right out again. But what will happen is that your jig will be away from your hook. So make sure you keep that all together just like that there. Also too, is if you do get a short bite, one thing you might do is look down here where your hook is wired on. What I've had to do a few times is because they will bite it and maybe you, may, maybe you have the thing on for you know a minute or two, whatever, before it comes off, is you'll see that even though it's wire and you would think that it couldn't happen, 
they'll start gnawing through this stuff. You know, there's sharp teeth and you'll see that some of the strands will come loose. You, basically, you got to re-rig it. You know, you got to cut that off and, and re-crimp. And uh, you can use the same hook, but you want to put a new crimp on there because that wire is somewhere getting compromised. You got to pay attention to yeah, that. Yeah, pay attention to that kind of stuff. And, and inspect the whole thing. You know, sometimes the Wahoo will come up and they'll, they'll, they'll come to eat your jig and they'll pass it up and they might bite it up real high. So whenever you get short bit, you want to make sure you check out your line, even check past up, past your knot. You know, it's crazy to think that, you know, you got this much wire on here that, that you'd be protected, but there's some times where just the nature of Wahoo, they're so fast. Going back to the Raider jig just for one moment, is uh -huh. it wired? So this one here isn't. This is going to be something that we're going to uh, kind of talk about different kind of rigging. Yeah. This one has some 150 pound fluoro on it. Okay. And we'll talk about why I'm doing that a little later when we talk okay. about winding speed and things like that. Perfect. But this is a real, real popular way to do it now. It's something that we didn't see before, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Good stuff so far, man. Yeah. The next one is also one of the ones I like. It's not always as productive, but when it is, it's, it's a big reward is fishing a surface iron. I've caught many Wahoo on surface iron and, and the first time I caught one, it was like, man, best thing ever. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Catching anything on a surface iron is cool. But catching a big wahoo is, is really, really a treat. Now, I do wire them up. Uh, I have caught fish that are not uh, wired up on the jigs, the surface iron jigs. But you do lose a lot of them that way. And so, uh, you know, I'll start off definitely wiring them up. And if I'm not getting bit, maybe I'll cut the wire leader off and try it without it. But I have hooked and landed several fish um, without, without a leader, no problem. Oh, okay. But you're going to fish this. A little different than than the other jigs and the reason i say that is you're going to fish it just like you're fishing yellowtail you want to swim the jig and if it's a jig that kind of requires a slower wind keep the slower wind and you're going to find with that wire leader it's going to have really good action you know like a lot of the old school guys would wire their jigs it actually is going to swim really good but swim it slow or medium you know whatever the jig requires and 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 almost act like you're fishing yellowtail and, and you'd be surprised at how many uh how many Wahoo would eat that service time real good? Excellent, man. And, and you get to see them blow out on it. Yeah, a lot too, of times. Right? Yeah, I've seen them just completely jump out of the water with the jig in his mouth. Big boils, you know, it's it's pretty cool. And we've all heard about the guy lifting the jig. You know, he didn't get bit and he's lifting the yeah. jig and a who goes through the galley window. Yeah, That's yeah. not a fable, is it? No, I, I haven't seen that specifically myself, but I, I've seen Wahoo jump 30 feet in the air. I mean, so for them to jump from the stern into the galley, it'd be no problem. Right. No right. problem at Amazing. all. Amazing. Yeah. So <coughs> the last one is one that I want to talk about that <coughs> maybe a lot of guys haven't really thought about. Oh, the dreaded spinning reel. The spinning gear, right? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> the reason, um, you know, I'm bringing this up is there's a, there's a, a guy who's on my uh, 11 day. His name is Les Merrill. He fishes with a, uh, a lot of conventional taco, just regular taco, but for Wahoo fishing, he does fish with spinning gear at times, not every time. And the reason he does it is for a very, very specific reason. And we're going to kind of start getting into more of the casting part of it here along with this kind of leads into it, but he doesn't do it because he needs it because he can't cast without it. When you uh, are, are fishing for Wahoo, one of the things that you want to do is that you want to be ready. Okay, so you got the four troll lines out and you're waiting to get a troll stop. Well, if, if you're not on the troll and you're gonna cast a jig out, you wanna really, really be ready. And by that, I don't mean no, just know where your jigs are having your stuff tied up. You wanna have your jig in your hand. In fact, a lot of times guys will be hanging out with their reel and free spool, ready to go, literally ready to go to where as soon as you get a bite, you can cast in the water right, right away. And so being ready is, is, is going to be probably the next number one thing that you want to be, uh, make sure you're always ready, ready to go. When that makes a great deal of sense because Wahoo are kind of solitary. I mean, you never give, go into a stop for a hundred who, you might get several out yeah. of it, but first guy in the water has got a much better chance, yep. I'm guessing. And if there's not all that many fish in the water, you want to really maximize yeah. everything you can to help you produce. Yeah. The typical pattern is going to be you're trolling around, you know, and, and you might be hooking them every 20 minutes. You know, it's not like you're, you're waiting a long time, but you're not gonna hook them and like you said, be on a, on a massive stop like you would for tuna. It's more of a wolf pack type thing. You know, there, there might be 50 or 60 Wahoo. Or, I mean, there might be 200 Wahoo in that school, but it's, those Wahoo just seem to move on. They don't stick to a boat 
like, like a big tuna school. A big tuna school might have 10,000 fish. You really don't have that with Wahoo. So when you do get a troll stike, you're probably going to hook, at best, you're probably going to hook 10 or 12, which would be really a really good stop. Hey, the helicopters, the helicopters are filming yeah, you. They want to know about the Wahoo too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But so, so you really want to be ready. You, know, you want to be in the water real quick. Now, some guys will hang out right next to the troll rods. And if there's room, that's okay. But what, what a lot of times happens is as you're trolling along, you got the you know four or five guys back here. Their buddies are back here talking to them or whatever, having a beer. You might have a couple crew members back here. So there are times where standing right next to where the troll rods are may not be the place to, to be, even though you would think, well, it makes sense. I want to be back and cast out and be next to the troll fish. And, and if there's room behind you, that's okay. But you want to be safe. If there isn't room behind you, you might see yourself go behind the bait tank between the bait tank and the tackle rack, depending on the boat you're on. It might be between the tackle rack and the galley or whatever. But you want to be anywhere where you can cast right away as soon as you see a troll strike. So even if you're up, up mid, mid ship, if you're first guy in the water and there's a guy behind that's further closer to the troll rods and your jig's in the water first, you're going to slide under them. When they cast, they're going to basically class over your line and they got to come in front of you now or behind you basically in order. So the first guy to get in the water, that's the most important. It's not necessarily the guy in the back. And so a lot of guys will get stuck back here. And so when they go to, to, to they want to cast, now they, they're like trying to wait for it to clear out. They got a couple crew members, plus the guys are trolling and the, their buddies are back here. Now they're going back. So you might find that it might take five or six seconds before the stern clears out that you can cast. If yeah. you're in an area that's already clear, boom, you're ready to go. And maybe you're hanging out over there and it gets crowded there. Well then slide up, you know, and, and kind of always be ready to be able to cast and part of that is being safe and making sure that there's no one behind you so you want to make sure that that's one of the things you think about as you're staying ready man i am learning so much about who fishing from you this is great so now we're going to lead into the spinning gear and why why mr les merrill uses the spinning gear. les is getting all the props this there, guy right? i mean he's he's a guy who uh who goes about things a different way sometimes but it's very well thought out and on the Wahoo fishing specifically, at first I thought it was kind of weird that he was using spinning gear thing. I'm like, man, why is he doing that for? You know, I mean, yeah. you know, you can fish. A, he had a, all this other nice gear. He's got, you know, he's got big gear. He's got everything. You know, why would he use a spinning reel? Well, what I noticed, and it's pursuant to what I was just talking to about being safe, is that he does hang out right next to the troll guy. And the advantage that he has is he's using a shorter spinning rod. This is a seven foot rod, but I think he even uses like a six foot rod. Oh. And the reason he does is he can underhand cast. Oh. So now he doesn't have to worry about anybody being behind him. So now he's actually, as we're trolling along, he has the jig hanging over the side with his finger basically ready to go, bail open, ready to go. So now he's ready this way. And when, when you get a troll strike, He's underhand. He doesn't have to worry about anybody being behind him or being unsafe. He's being totally safe and getting in the water right away. So even though, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say the spinning, you got to have a spinning rod to catch a Wahoo. If you've ever thought about using a spinning rod that you already have, if you have a shorter rod, that might be another tip to get you in the water a little quicker. Yeah, and that makes all the difference in the world sometimes. I yeah. like Les. I like the way he thinks outside he's, yeah. the box, man. He's, he's got a couple tricks here that I've actually over the time, I'm, I'm sure I could probably bring up some other stuff, but for right now, We'll stick to the Wahoo fishing. All right, perfect. Yeah. Next thing we're going to talk about is kind of like uh, when to cast. Well, we just talked about that a little bit, but, but maybe when you're winding, how fast to wind and things like that. So I think we're going to change positions on the camera and check that out. Perfect. All right. So the next question I ask is, you know, how far do I need to cast? You know, what, you know, what do I need to do? You see a lot of guys just drop straight down, that kind of thing. My opinion is the more water you cover, the better. So I, I fish longer rods. Uh, we actually didn't talk about the rods too much here, but I fish longer rods. Define and, long. Uh, nine foot, 10 okay. foot, like a regular jig stick, yellowtail jig stick. Okay. Not a really specific Wahoo style rod, but just my, my yellowtail rods. And uh, so I like making a long bombing cast and covering a lot of water. There's kind of a double-edged sword of that. On the one hand, you are covering water, but it takes you a little longer to get in the zone because now you're way, way out. And maybe if those fish are a little closer, you might be going past them. So you can kind of maybe try both. Maybe try casting long or casting short. You might mix it up. I personally like casting long. I think covering more water is better. When you cast out, you make your long cast or a short cast. 
you want to let the jigs sink out a good ways. We're not really yellowtail fishing, except for when you're doing the surface iron, you will fish it up on the surface. But with a raider or a, or a bomb, you're going to cast out, let that thing sink way, way out. You're going to be almost at a 45 degree angle with your, with your jig. And even that's something that you might mix up. Maybe you'll let a little bit less, a little bit more, but you really are, are, are fishing more like a yo-yo jig where you're just more of a vertical, not quite vertical, but maybe 45 degree angle. Once you, once you get to that speed or that depth and you're ready to start winding is how fast do you wind? Well, obviously we all know that Wahoo are speedsters. You're not going to outwind them for sure. A hundred percent. Those things are, you know, you swim probably 50 miles an hour or something like yeah, that. Yeah. In fact, some estimates are 60 miles yeah, an hour. It's top incredible. speed on the fastest wind, you're probably at around seven or eight or something like yeah. that. So you're not, yeah. you're not going to outwind them. So wind as fast as you can. A, guy, a lot of guys tell me, well, you know, how fast do I wind? The best description that I've been able to kind of come up with is you want to look at it almost like gas mileage on your car. If you go on 90 miles an hour, yeah, you're going to get there real quick, but you're going to run out of fuel real quick. So what I mean by that is your own personal your energy. Yeah. Six o'clock in the morning, when you first get started that day, you're going to be ready to run, ready to go. Well, you get to about 11, maybe after lunch, two o'clock in the afternoon, those fish start to bite. You might be burned out, you might be out of fuel. Yeah. So you wanna, you wanna kinda like regulate. Pace yourself. Yeah, pace yourself. Make sure that you're not gonna, gonna run out of juice at the end of the day. So you wanna figure out how fast that is. You wanna go as fast as you can for as long as you can. Yeah. When you wind, one of the things that uh, also the guys on the Royal Star taught me is to basically plant the rod on the rail. The reason for that is, is a couple. First, as you're winding, another thing too, before I get to that part is, get into a comfortable position. You'll see some guys that, that are just winding up here like regular, you know, which is, which is good if, if that's okay for you. But what, what those guys showed me is that if I have the rod planted on the rail, as I'm winding, there's a lot less torque back and forth because you're sticking the rod here. It's almost like someone's holding the rod there for you. Yeah and you're able to wind just as fast, but when you get bit, now the rod is so stable that you're able to put that extra crank, extra couple cranks into the fish to get bit, to, to, uh, to sink the hook in, yes. set the hook. That's probably the most important thing. When you do get bit, you keep the rod down and you're gonna keep winding until, until you can't wind no more. After you can't wind, you're gonna basically step away and in a straight line to your fish, that's going to also put pressure because now you can't whine. After that's when you start fighting your fish. Yeah. But you really want to be down here stuck to the rail and whining as hard as you can. When you get bit and you just can't whine no more, start walking back and now go back to your fighting position and you start fighting a fish just like a tuna or a yellowtail. That is such good info because you mentioned already in this seminar that some guys get one out of seven hooks. <coughs> so that hook set yes. is essential and this helps you to get that really, really good firm hook set. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to wind hard, wind fast, wind hard. When you get bit, stay right, stay right on the rail until you can't wind anymore, and then um, and then get in your fine position. Another thing too that a lot of guys are um, pretty aware of, but is the most awesome thing until you see it is how fast these things are. So you want to be ready to be mobile. If you get bit, I mean, one out of every five times. That thing will shoot up to the bow. And you don't even know it. So fast. It's yeah. crazy, man. Your line's going to be like this, and that fish is way up there. You're like, so, what, what the hell? Yeah, so exactly. when that happens, you're not walking up like you're fishing a yellow. So you're running right as fast as you can, all the way up. And sometimes it'll be all the way back and all the way back up. And other Wahoo would just fight like a regular yellow to or tuna. But you get that one crazy one. I mean, that thing's all over the place. Yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's so awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I love it. The one thing I mentioned earlier about rod length here, we're going to go into some rigging, but I do want to mention it'd be easier to, to demonstrate out here. You know, real common rod length is seven foot, seven and a half foot, and, and that works good too. You know, the reason people like that is that you're casting heavy jigs and you could cast it with a, with a, a lot shorter rod. You don't need a long rod. In fact, even back before, guys used to use six and a half foot rods, was real common. But I, I like using this longer rod. I know we're talking about these nine foot rods. And it seems like it'd be counteractive with, with the way Wahoo fishing is it, that you want to be kind of in control. But what I found is that with Wahoo and all their head shaking and they're just erratic movement is that the bend in the rod will take up a lot of that slack. And what I mean by that is you get a fish and you're fighting them like, like a yellowtail. Okay. Let me tighten up this drag a little bit here. 
So that bend in the rod is gonna is gonna be something that you're gonna want to keep in there, and you're fighting them just like a yellowtail. You want to do real short. In fact, as hard as you can, but real short. And you'll see that once you got that fish turned, he's gonna be coming your way. But you really want to make sure you keep a good bend in the rod, a lot of bend, because if that fish head shakes or anything like that changes direction, it'll take up that slack just a little bit before you can wind back down on them. So that's why I use long rods. I know it's not going to be as convenient as having 25 long rods in the back of the boat, but one other tip, the reason you might want to have one of those, it's, it, it does keep fish, I believe keeps fish hooked a little bit better. So we're going to talk a little bit about Wahoo rigging. Um, I'll show you guys a couple things here. There's basically two kinds of bait leader wires is going to be your standard uh, stainless wire, which we've been using forever. And then there's the uh, titanium wire. Now this titanium wire, <clears throat> apparently you can tie it, you know, like uh, use a, a, a clinch knot and stuff like that. I, I haven't really tried it, but uh, apparently that's one way you can do it. But the main benefit of this wire, the uh, titanium wire that is, is that when you're fishing in an area where there's mixed wahoo and tuna, usually it's skipjack, but mixed wahoo and tuna, is that when a tuna grabs your bait, your, uh, your bait leader, your wire leader gets kinked up really bad. Like you can't use it at anymore. So if there's a lot of skipjack around, you're getting 25 skipjack to one wahoo, well, you're gonna go through 25 bait leaders before you, you get a wahoo. So it can be a little frustrating. You gotta go through a lot of, a lot of bait leaders that way. And so, uh, so one way to combat that is to use the titanium wire. This will probably go through maybe, you know, I don't know, 10 times as many. You'll probably be able to get seven or eight, nine fish before, uh, before it starts getting kinked up. So uh, it is a lot more expensive, but it saves you time on having to make, make leaders and having to retie a brand new leader. And so that's, that, those are the things there. The, uh, the wire that I use for everything else is just stranded wire. Uh, this is seven strand. They don't make it anymore, but uh, uh, American Fishing Wire, they, they make uh, all the different size stranded wires and you'll see it um, labeled as a one by seven, seven strand, and uh, everything from 40 to, to, you know, 130, 200, 300 pound stuff. But, but mainly for the jigs and what we're doing, we're using a lot of 60 and 90 pound wire. I, I use mostly 90 pound. That seems to work just as good as a 60 and I figure it's a little stronger. But so those are the, those are the two sizes you're going to get. The, the crimps for uh, when we were doing that, that um, uh, fluorocarbon leader, you want to use that uh, to the size of the of the, the leader material that you're going to use. So you just want to match that up. Typically, it'll be on the back there. It'll show what it what it what will work. And then on the uh, crimps, you're going to use basically size one and two round crimps, and they'll use they'll be called single leader crimps. Um, we'll get you. I actually didn't bring the right packages here, but we'll, we'll send you some uh, pictures of those uh, so you can put up a little, little bit later. Well, first we're going to go through um, the uh, fluorocarbon leader, and al also too is is this tool here. This is a tool that I, I don't sell at the shop. It's not really a fishing tool. It's a Nyko Press Crimper 17-2. This is a, a crimping tool that uh, you'll see a lot of guys that long range fish have this crimper. Uh, you can search it online. You can buy them. Um, they're usually about they're pretty expensive. They're like fifty sixty dollars. But it works so good that if you're serious about wahoo fishing, it's something that you want to have. It's got two holes there, and that pretty much does everything from your bait leaders up to these um, these kind of leaders here. What we're going to do, and even like maybe up to about 130 pound wire, it'll do just fine. And I'll show you one here. Um, really simple, just goes right through the crimp, back through there. Leave a little bit of a tag, and you're gonna put it in the, that one's a bigger one. Put it in the bigger hole. And that's it. You're ready to go. So it's real simple. It's not real complicated. Um, and this big 150 pound leader, you're not using it for strength like you would, you know, uh, like a big tuna or something like that. It's really strictly for abrasion, for tooth abrasion. So don't get too caught up on 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 the crimp itself and how hard you have to squeeze it. You just want to have the right size crimp. And you pretty much want to use the smallest crimp that the material will go through. And you could cut that a little bit shorter, but pretty much just like that would be would be fine for me. I think that's that'll hold just fine. And you attach it to your jig. 
The next thing I'll show you here is going to be uh, putting on the the stranded wire onto your uh, jig, and it's very similar. This is a round crimp. It's kind of hard to see on the camera, I'm sure, but you're going to put the wire right through there, through your jig, back through the crimp, and the difference here is that we're going to run it back again through the crimp, okay? And you'll see that little loop there. You're gonna pull the one side to reduce the size of that loop. I'm not sure how well that shows up on the camera. And then the whole loop here, will squeeze that down. And that's about the size there. And then we're gonna crimp that. And for this guy here, we use a small hole. There's two holes right in the middle. And pretty hard there, but not crazy hard where you got to crimp it down on the table, nothing like that, but that's ready to go. That's ready to catch Oahu right there. Real simple, real easy, real fast. I'll do another one on the swivel side. Drop that one. Right through there. And once, once you get comfortable with it. I mean, this is something that you can do at your tackle box, you know, I mean, you don't, you know, sometimes people get intimidated by it, but you know, like I was speaking earlier on watching your, your, uh, wire leaders and, and your, uh, jig leaders, if, if they get compromised where you see some of the, the wire getting messed up, you know, change it out, you know, it's so easy to do, as you can see, you can do that between stops, you know, and you're ready to go. That's it. So this this jig right here is ready to fish again. Pretty simple. A lot of it is having the right tool. This 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 tool really 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 helps. What so, is that again? The, the so it's a Nyco Press is the brand. Nyco Press. Yeah the the model of the tool they make hundreds of tools. It's a seventeen two. It's actually from what I understand it's a telecommunications tool. It's something that guys that do that kind of work they use this tool for small crimps. But it's just so perfect and it has the two sizes that you need. Typically with a larger crimping tool, something like this, this is more for like the big mono, and that'll work as well for um, for that big that big uh, mono and a fluorocarbon crimp, that'll work for that as well. But um, you can just use the one tool for all that. But these bigger tools like this, um, you know, we use for the big kite leaders and things like that. You know, it's a very, very good tool, but the holes are a little bit too big for the small bait leaders. It'll probably still work for that, like I was saying, uh, but but not for the small uh, crimps that we're using for what we're doing. Then the last one is going to be a bait leader. So I already have it strung through once and twice, and we're going to string it through again, just like on the um, on the jig leader. The main difference is that when we go back around, because the wire is um, a lot a lot uh, stiffer, we're going to have to purposefully put that bend into the wire that's going to go back the third time. And to do that, you'll basically grab the end of it, use your fingernail, and then kind of crease it. As you see, it's kind of getting bent there. I'm not sure if you can, how you can see that there. But you'll kind of squeeze that down with your finger. You kind of be careful. You don't pick your finger there, but um, squeeze that down to where you can get it nice and flat, just like on this guy here. And you could use a pair of pliers as well to kind of squeeze that down. And now when you bring that back in, it's going to be, it'll fit right into that crimp, just like that. And then now you'll get your loop size down and you'll use a small hole. Squeeze that guy, you're good to go. And um, on the size crimps, like I was saying earlier, it's a size one size two, they even have a size zero, which would probably work for like for your, your uh, 20 pound wire, real small wire. But that's pretty simple, that's that's a, that's how it goes. Also too, I wanted to kind of mention when we were talking about that surface iron thing and um, getting creative, you know, this is a, a lure here, a couple lures that, that um, I haven't used this guy yet, but I'm, I'm sure it's gonna work just as good. This is a Shimano a stick bait, Katsumahu on this guy as well. But we're also going to put a, a wire leader on this guy, just like we did on the on the Wahoo bomb, same like that. 
This Wahoo bomb is from uh, JRI. They call it a Huicide bomb. And the difference here is it doesn't have the wire going through it. It's a uh, molded lure here that has the eye right there. So you'll need to attach your lure. Also did want to mention one other thing here that, that uh, um, uh, when we're talking about trying to catch Wahoo and how hard they are to hook, and sometimes you don't get too many, they don't bite too good, especially when there's been four or five boats go through an area, the Wahoo are really, really susceptible to pressure. If you get four or five boats that go through an area, ahead of you, you know, you, you might have Wahoo in the, in the area, but they're just, they get real boat shy and you know, they just don't want to bite. And so if you get into that situation where you tried the bombs, you tried the jigs, you tried the, the, the mono fluorocarbon leader on your jigs, you tried bait and, and, and just seems like nothing's working is last resort, uh, which seems like you're going to go through a lot of jigs, but going straight fluorocarbon 40 pound right to your jig, you know, which even something like this, you would think, man, you know, that Wahoo doesn't, doesn't have a whole lot before it can bite you, bite you off. And you're right. You know, I, I've seen guys lose 15, 20, 25 jigs on a, on a trip over maybe two or three days, which is a lot. But I bet you that guy also came back with 10, 12 Wahoo. So sometimes you got to make that decision as to, you know, the jigs that you take with you that you bought, you know, sometimes we got to buy them and just plan on leaving them there. It's like going to Vegas, man. <laughs> Spend the money. If you, if you don't come back with anything, you're, you had a good time, but you know, with, with, the, with the jigs, you kind of, you know, leave that one in your, in your back pocket as another way of, of trying last resort getting bit is just going straight fluorocarbon for your 50 pound, whatever you have on your rod and, uh, and kind of going for it. And you, you are going to lose jigs. I mean, you'll lose them on, they'll eat it on the drop sometimes, but you will definitely get more, 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 uh, more bites that way. So that's another thing I wanted to share with you guys there is, 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 is the different levels of what you can do to increase your odds. Of course, the more you increase it, the more you're, you increase the chance you might lose a couple jigs, but definitely uh, definitely get you more bites. Nothing like Wahoo Fishing. You have shed an incredible amount of knowledge on to me and everybody else. Sam, great stuff. Anything else? That's it. That's it. I just got to share with you a couple pictures on some of the products. And, and uh, I, I unfortunately didn't have them. I have them in baggies in my pet tackle bag. Um, well, actually, maybe one more thing here. This bag here, this is from Mustad. It's a double rigger wallet, and this thing's jam packed. It's got more than Wahoo stuff, but mostly Wahoo stuff. And it has bombs in here, um, you know, a whole bunch of Raider jigs, other kind of jigs, Taddy jigs, Salus jigs. And so the reason that I keep everything separate like that is um, typically on a long range trip, when you're going to go do Wahoo fishing, they kind of will target them for two or three days, you know, if you're lucky, usually just one day, even sometimes. but whenever you're in that wahoo zone and, and, and that's what you guys are doing that way you're not you're not having your your stuff all spread all over your tackle box you'll have everything in one area this is the the mustad double rigger wallet that's probably the only other thing i can share with with you guys keep your stuff organized but uh, a wallet like this really helps out and if we want to come and talk to you in person we can come to island fishing tackle in carson california how do we find you there 21809 Avalon Boulevard. We're just off the 405 freeway. If you want to call down to the shop and uh, uh, ask questions, it's 310-707-1205. Uh, Anytime, we're open six days a week, 10 to 6, Monday through Saturday. Sam, thanks again for all your time and sharing this great knowledge with all the fishermen out there. You got it. What can I tell you? Sam De La Torre, you should go visit him down at Island Fishing Tackle in Carson, California. The man and his staff, for that matter, just a wealth of information awaits you. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this great seminar on how you can catch a Wahoo. I know that there's a nice big one in your future really soon. Don't forget to give us a like, subscribe, and to share this video with someone you love. Thanks again, my friends, and I hope to see you really, really soon.